everyone, and welcome to the Blackout Series, proudly brought to you by Black Creatives Aotearoa. My name is Diane Wesch, and I'm so honored to be your host for this series. We're currently on our 12th interview, and we only have one more to go. So for all of our viewers who have been tuning in, thank you so much for your support. I hail from Virginia Beach, Virginia, and I'm the proud product of tough Haitian immigrants. I'm also an inclusive marketing consultant and the founder of Got Blacklisted. As y'all know, we're not here to sugarcoat the hard stuff, but rather to share our stories, our collective truths. We'll dive deep into COVID-19, art, and the global Black Lives Matter movement. Please keep in mind that Black Creatives Out There Aurora is not a mental health provider, but rather a community of Black creatives aiming to elevate the Black consciousness. Interviews are normally 30 minutes, but on certain occasions, they may run up to 45. So if you have any questions during the interview, please be sure to insert them in the comment section below prior to 1230. And now, allow me to welcome our guest this afternoon. Jess B is a powerful female rap artist and former professional netball player. She's been crafting rap since high school and credits Missy Elliott and Timbaland as her musical heroes. She has performed at a diverse range of festivals and events and won Best New Zealand Act at the 2019 MTV Europe Music Awards. Welcome, Jess B. Would you like to introduce yourself to our viewers? Hi. <laughs> How is everyone? Um, my name is Jess, um, Jess B, and I am of Kenyan descent and I am an artist and that's pretty much me um obviously like I used to play netball and yeah I was born and raised in Auckland thank you for that powerful intro um so are you ready for your rapid fire questions yeah hit me all right so your favorite hobby outside of making music is um probably exercising going to the gym I do that every day so I guess that's something I enjoy Okay. It's pretty late, actually. <laughs> nice. What's your worst habit? Um, oh, that's a good one. Leaving my towels on the ground after I shower. <laughs> I hanging them back up. Who was your first celebrity crush? Um, I think it was Corbin Blue from High School Musical. Um, <laughs> Going back in time a little bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we are. Um, your go-to dance move is? Oh my gosh. Um, my go-to dance move. I have like three that I rotate regularly, but I don't really know. It depends no. on the feeling. Yeah. Okay. Um, what are three things you must do every day? Um, I would say exercise. Um, brush my teeth <laughs> and probably some sort of like social interaction I really like um being around people so I feel good when I be doing that so yeah and what is your favorite thing to do before performing a live gig um it depends on the context but usually I like to make sure that I feel warm um especially with a bit like a sporting background I'm pretty like um I'm quite structured before I go and perform shows. So I like to make sure that I'm like warmed up and like feeling limber. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. So let's go ahead and jump into this. Um, so obviously we've had two lockdowns now. Um, what's been your most fulfilling artistic experience during the second lockdown? Gosh, I think it's actually been a really hard year creatively, to be honest with you. Um, I think that I, especially because I like working in the studio with people um, and obviously that's not been an option during the lockdown so I've had to actually really challenge myself creatively. Um, I was lucky in the second lockdown that I had um, access to a studio that I could go to by myself um, and so I was actually I actually allowed myself to try try some different things creatively because um, I think sometimes when you're around other people there is that pressure of like feeling like you want to be good or you know, you don't want to try something and look like, you know, a complete rookie. So being by myself, I was actually able to sort of like push the parameters of like what I normally do, um, which is like equal parts frustrating and great, you know, because it's like learning anything you learn that's new is um, really hard. But I think, yeah, it was awesome to be able to have that time um, to do creative stuff alone in a space that's like really quiet and there's no distractions and all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I'm sure you were able to get like a lot of self-reflection and to do a lot of processing, especially with the global pandemic. Um, and of course, a lot of artists like losing their gigs. Uh, what other creative mediums did you like dig into? I mean, I, I guess like as an artist, I have to kind of consider lots of things, especially like the visual aspects of like um, music, just because it's all part and parcel. I mean, everything else that I do creatively is sort of like just for my own enjoyment. Um, but like I've been trying, you know, like different things, especially this year where, like you say, music's not actually been an option to perform live. So I've been sort of dabbling in, you know, tried like edit video editing and um, different things like that just to kind of, I don't know, yeah. keep, keep entertained. Keep the creativity flowing. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah, just yeah. that. That's always good to do. Um, yeah. And so now obviously, you know, as well, post lockdown, um, we're currently in level one. How has life changed for you? Well, I mean, I guess I've been lucky enough in the sense that like my life hasn't changed too much. It's just more the like, plans and things that I had in place for this year obviously all went out the window so I guess I've had to be a lot more um okay with not knowing where the heck I'm kind of going <laughs> in terms of my music career um not that you have that much in the creative you know realms you don't have that much control over a lot of things anyway but I guess like I have plans to go overseas this year and um you know, work with artists and do sessions overseas and travel and stuff. So all of those have been put on the back burner. So I guess it's been a good time just to focus on um, what's going on here in the communities here, you know, um, that you can become too busy to tap into if you're always, you know, on, on the go. Yeah. yeah. So it's been like, it's been cool to be able to like spend some time at home and, and figure things out. Yeah. And with uh, um, this year being so unpredictable, do you kind of, have a certain fear going forward? Or are you kind of more in excited for kind of the unknown? It's a good question. I mean, I'm not, I don't think I'm fearful. Um, I guess you just, you really just have to be okay with, because I mean, I guess for me, we don't know what the context of the next five years is going to be and whether we will be able to travel. So if I, if we can't travel the next five years, oh God. it's going to change. <laughs> my whole career, you know what I mean? Like the trajectory of my whole career is going to change. So um, I guess for me, it's more just being like having my eyes and being open to more than just one thing because we, I don't know whether that one thing is going to be able to happen, you know? Yeah. Um, but I'm definitely okay with being like doing music in New Zealand at the moment. It's been cool. That's good. That's, that's really great to hear. And just be, you really break the mold with your collaborations and music videos. Just recently, I watched your brand new video, Bullseye. Um, and I must say, it was super dope. Uh, definitely gave me a lot of Missy Elliott vibes. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> what inspired the visuals for this video? Um, so I guess this was a collaborative effort with um, Connie Cash, who are directing duo, and um, I'm really lucky because they are actually two of my really good friends. Um, so they're made up of um, Shaquille Wasasala, who was also known as Half Queen, who is my DJ, um, and Paloma Schneidman. So they're just my, they're friends that I've had for quite a few years, and I think they just really know me as a person. So when we talk creatively about, especially music videos, which they've done, this is the third music video that they've done for me. Um, they sort of already know like the sort of things that I like visually or like the messages that I'm like trying to send. So I really just went to them and I was like, you know, this is a turbo song. And it was one of my favorites off the, um, the mix hack that I just dropped, um, both to perform live and also just in the energy of it. So I really wanted it to have a moment. And I kind of, the only thing that I knew about the song is it made me feel like running. So I was kind of just like, went to them and I was like, yeah, I want to do a video. I definitely want to be running. Um, and that was, we kind of went from there and we kind of, yeah, took it all the way and went super weird with it. You know, um, it's really cool to not play it safe when you're doing music videos and to really push the creative bounds. So um, we decided to do something that was kind of the opposite of what you might think in your mind when you hear the song. Um, because I guess a lot of, um, especially with hip hop and stuff, you kind of already have that like urban context when you're listening. Um, so to put the music video out in a forest, you know what I mean? It really like takes it out of where you might have already put it and in, into a completely different line. Um, 
so yeah, it was such an awesome experience. It was a crazy shoot day. It was 16 hours or something. Ooh, yes. um, but yeah, I was so stoked with how, it come, how it's come out. Yeah, the visuals are amazing. So to our viewers, if you haven't watched it, definitely check it out. Uh, it is an incredible video. It's an Thank incredible you. track as well. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I have to ask you, I know you previously stated like you love exercise. Your favorite part was running. Can you share with us how many times you had to redo that scene of the, that, just that running scene? Oh you know, my God. Girl, it was crazy. Like um, that whole day was me running. I was probably running for like on and off for like probably four hours or something. Like, oh, so it's just kind of like we'd do one. So there's probably like six or seven different, camera shots of me running but each one they had to do like 10 times you know what I mean so like they'd get me to run and then I'd reset straight away go back do it again so by the end of the day I was actually really sore the next day <laughs> I like, imagine. I be running but it was a lot it was a lot yes and what's the overall message um you're trying to send to your audience um regarding just the visuals and also the lyrics of this track um well, I think I've kind of been asked about this track before and um, sort of asking me what it's about. And it's funny because sometimes, sometimes when I'm writing, it's less about me sitting down with a fully formed idea that I want to turn into a song and more just like uh, one sentence or one line that comes to me. And usually, and sometimes it can even be influenced by the actual track, um, like the, the music that's, or the producer um, who's making the beat. So um, this one was very much like, I don't know, for me, it just, because it, it's like so high energy, it just reminded me of like being in, you know, with like, especially within the black community and you go out and you know, there's crazy dance circles and everybody's like doing their thing. Um, so I guess I was just, I was touching on that feeling for me, but then also I guess I always am political with it. So I always drop lines here and there about different things. Um, and the video, I guess, like we tried to keep it quite low concept so that there were a million different interpretations of the visuals. Because obviously, um, I don't want to reveal, reveal too much because I want yeah, people yeah, to, yeah, watch to watch it. it. Yeah. Um, yeah, but uh, it's, I guess, about finding, yeah, finding your people and finding your spaces, I guess, in, in a nutshell. But again, yeah, there's a lots of different ways that you can look at it. Had lots of different people message me with like their interpretations, which are actually ones that I hadn't thought about before. So it's really cool to see people, how people view it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And get their different perspectives, which is really yeah. awesome. Yeah. And Bullseye's a track taken from your mixed state three nights in Amsterdam. Can you break down a few of the six tracks and what our viewers can expect, what kind of vibes our viewers can expect to get from that mixtape? Yeah, so um, I made this mixtape in Amsterdam over three nights, um, which is why it's called what it is. Um, and I, I made it last year. And I guess in my career thus far um you know i've worked with people from new zealand and from australia and i've always sort of struggled to find producers that really tapped into the sounds that i wanted to on like in a level or at a level that was you know world class um so especially in the realm of like dance hall and afro beats and stuff there's not um that many established producers yet you know like there's definitely actually now there's a lot more um people you know doing really cool stuff but when I was over in Amsterdam I met these producers and had sessions with them and I'd never had the chance to work in that realm before so I guess it's a mashup of like dance hall afro beats reggaeton um EDM like electronic music and hip-hop so it's just a whole big huge mashup of all of the sort of sounds that I love listening to and creating. Um, and so I literally made all of the tracks over the three days. And um, in terms of breakdowns, I wrote, um, there's, a, there's one called 09 to the World Freestyle. Um, and it's, it was quite a, it was a crazy experience to find myself creating music in Amsterdam. Um, I can't say I'd ever thought that I would ever be doing that. So it was quite a surreal feeling and um, really like, I felt so validated like on my journey, like, or I just felt so stoked to be there and I felt so happy that I was making music that I liked. So I kind of, so that song was inspired by 
you know, being coming from Auckland and then ending up, you know, in some place in, in the world that you never thought you'd be. Um, uh, what's another track? I wrote a song called Shut Up, um, which is like, I guess a more aggressive message, but I was sort of like um, about the idea of being able to uh, shut up uh, and listen when conversations, uh, or, you know, like being able to listen to conversations that don't necessarily involve or center you um, and knowing when to just be quiet and listen to the stories um, and acting accordingly. Um, and then I, oh, I wrote a song called We That Filth. Um, so we, me and Shaq, my DJ and music video director and best friend, um, we were actually over in Amsterdam together and uh, we throw a party called Filth. Um, so the, I guess the, the word, the name of the party Filth is kind of like a play on um, the idea of being, you know, othered or outcast or all of those different things. So the song is kind of about my experience with that and um, also an ode to the party. So, yeah. Um, yeah, sounds like you had a great time in Amsterdam. Oh, um, it was so awesome. It was so <laughs> awesome. I want to go back. Really want to go back. What was your greatest challenge doing that mixtape? Um, gosh. Well, you know what? I think actually of all the projects that I've ever done, I mean, this one was very, it, was, it wasn't planned. Um, and when you don't have any expectations, things actually happen really easily. Um, so I guess for me, the, big, the biggest challenge was sort of coming home after that experience in Amsterdam and getting everything over the line, you know, getting everything finished. But it was also like, just one of, it was just one of those experiences that was just so awesome because I walked in having no idea what, was going to come and who the people even were and sort of left after having this like amazing chemistry with the producers and writing songs that I really really liked and was enthusiastic about and whilst being overseas you know so it felt really it was a really cool experience for sure and and slightly left the field of what I have been doing I guess. Mm. And I'm, I always feel like whenever, I don't know if you feel the same way, whenever you travel, you kind of gain like this burst of insight and creativity. Did you feel like you were more energized when you came back to Auckland? Like you wanted to do so much more creative things after, um, you know, doing all the work that you did in Amsterdam? Oh, absolutely. Like it's, yeah, it, that's exactly how I'll describe it. It's like I went, especially, you know, like, cause while we were over there, we were also in London and I think for, me and Shaq who were traveling together it's amazing to see sort of like especially in London for me like being a part like being able to see like the black community and like how established they are in sort of like every single like creative sector and like I was just meeting so many amazing people who were doing amazing things that so it kind of made us feel like we wanted to come back here and do the same stuff and you know create those amazing you know, subcultures here. Um, yeah, and I definitely just came back and I was like, I need to go back again. Like, I loved it so much. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Jess, I want to go ahead and transition this combo uh, conversation. Uh, this year, the BLM movement went global and thousands of Kiwis showed up in solidarity to attend the Auckland protest. In your opinion, why do you believe it is important to acknowledge what is happening overseas? Gosh, um, well, I guess uh, I think that it's important because, you know, we are living in a world now that is completely, it's more connected than, you know, we've ever been. And so we really do have the ability now to tap into, or you know, stand in solidarity with um, people from all over the world. And I guess um, I read a quote like, recently on I think it was on, it was on Instagram and I was just saying you know um just because you're removed from a situation doesn't mean that you can't you know use your voice to to advocate for the things that you believe in um and so I don't think that because we're here in New Zealand with a different experience that it means that we shouldn't be really really vocal about seeing people that look like us go through something um mm -hmm. you know overseas and then on top of that, I also think that it's really important because obviously in New Zealand, we have 
our own set of problems here um, that, you know, although they're not, they're not the same, um, but, you know, there's definitely um, issues here and especially, you know, for the indigenous people here, um, they suffer greatly, you know, at the systems that are in place here. So I think it's really important to, you know, be able to show sol solidarity for people overseas and then also bring it back and contextualize it for like where we are and what we're doing and the people that we live with. Um, because yeah, it's all mirrors, you know, yeah. everything is the shining lights on these different things um, that all need to be talked about. Yeah, thank you for sharing that powerful um, perspective. Um, and Jesse, you know, I had to do a little digging. Uh, so I, you know, peeped some of your socials. Um, and there was one image of you that was taken that I saw on your Facebook page uh, that I really admired. You're with a group of friends and one woman was holding up a sign that said, will you still stand for us when BLM isn't trending? Mm. Can you share with us, um, in your opinion, why you believe that message is important? Well, I think that, you know, I guess with the social media age now and like, there's definitely, uh, you know, like there's this idea that you can just become part of like a current discussion. And I guess the whole hashtag thing, it's like when it was all going on, obviously everybody's posting up on their stories and showing that, you know, solidarity, but we obviously need to be also acting on those things so it's it's one thing to bring it up in discussion um but until anything changes then that discussion's kind of you know pointless so i guess it's a talk, it's just referencing this idea of you know like after everything online dies down which it always does um what are people doing in their own lives to you know dismantle you know things that colonization have brought, thing, you know, um, white supremacy and all these things, what are you actually doing in your lives to be able to change the things around you? And the conversations are always so big and they seem so, um, like one person can't change, you know, the way systems are, but you can, you know, call your boss out or tell your ugly auntie that's racist to stop, you know what I mean? There's ways that you can, um, apply these things in your own life to, um, you know, just be doing a little bit. So I guess that's just a, a little reference to those sorts of things. I think it's very important mm -hmm. to not be swept up by how big it is and, you know, still know that as an individual, you can really make a lot of change in the people mm -hmm. in the world around you, you know? And um, during the, when the BLM movement was trending, there was a huge uptick in people and brands, especially trying to dig into and hire black creatives. Did you find this any type of maybe it kind of looked like performatism in like the music industry? Um, I think I did feel a little bit like, I mean, at one point I had quite a lot of um, sort of media outlets um, mm -hmm specifically coming to me and a couple of other people in the black community that I guess are visible um, for our opinions. Um, and it got a little bit frustrating because I just found, I just felt like I was sort of becoming like a poster child for, you know, a community that is so diverse and, you know, it's, it's not really fair on individuals to put that pressure on them to speak for an entire community yes. of people. But also like, I feel like, there's so many more um, qualified voices that could be speaking on these things in ways that are really, really poignant and well versed. But obviously, because as an entertainer, I'm someone who is visible. Um, but just because I'm visible doesn't mean I'm the best person to be asking, you know? Um, so I did feel a little bit like that. And I felt a little bit of pressure to be saying the right thing on behalf of everybody I was speaking for. But um, I think. I guess the music industry is a funny one too, though, because um, obviously I'm in hip hop, which is like, you know, very much um, black culture, African-American culture. So yeah, you, you definitely have to tread lightly with that stuff. I think that most people have been pretty good, um, but I mean. Yeah, and I wanna, I wanna ask, I wanna know your perspective. Why do you feel like we have to tread lightly, especially as black women? Why do you feel that we have to, kind of really be cautious in the words we say, because you know, we, all, you, we obviously all heard of um, black rage. Um, why can't we express ourselves, you know, and you know, 
be allowed to be angry? Why do we always feel like we have to dilute and diminish what we say, especially when it comes to these issues that have been, that have been prevalent for so long? Gosh, that is such a <laughs> conversation. I mean, I think that like, I definitely feel pressure in my career, my personal experience of like the music industry, I guess that um, I have to make myself very, very likable um, mm -hmm. because if I'm not likable, it's very easy, I guess, for people just to go, okay, cool. Well, we're not going to book you. We don't mm -hmm. care. Oh, you know what I mean? It's very easy to be iced out of things. Um, so I guess, I mean, personally, yeah, I feel um, pressures for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, gosh, why do we have to tread lightly? I mean, that's so unfortunate though, that we, that you have to feel that way though. Right. You know? Yeah, definitely. I, I think that there's so many layers to it. I think that, mm -hmm. um, you know, being a black or a person of color is a, a one layer. Being a woman is another layer. You know, mm -hmm. I think that there's lots of things to be said about that. I don't know how much time we have, but I know. <laughs> No, that was a list. this would be like a way longer than the few minutes that we have left. But yeah, but I mean, I will say that like, I guess if um, I've tried to really n not fall into those ways of thinking, I kind of tried to be really like, I guess, unapologetic if you want to, you know, use that word in terms of like, at least who I am, you know what I mean? Like I, I'm a social person and I really like people generally. So it's not hard for me to be nice, but I won't ever change my politics for people. You know what I mean? Or I won't ever like not say how I, what I believe in just because I'm worried about someone liking me, you know? Yes. And that's great to hear. And Jess, you were recently part of the Richer With Me campaign that was done by uh, Jay Hall to celebrate diversity in New Zealand. Can you share why being part of that project was important to you? Um, well, first of all, I think Jay's amazing. And I think that, you know, <laughs> it's such a, it was such an interesting idea of, um, you know, bringing people together um, who've probably, like when, when he asked me, when he told me the question, you know, like why is New Zealand richer with you? I was, I was quite stumped. Like I thought I had actually never ever thought about that before, which is why it's such a great, you know, topic of discussion because like we don't really stop and think about those things. I don't, th I think it's more retrospective when you look back and you go, Oh yeah. Like, you know, collectively we did that great thing. Um, but while you're in it, it's a lot harder to see um, what's going on. So um, I just think it's important, especially as well for, lots of different people from the black community to voice their their stories i think they deserve to be heard and um yeah i just thought it was great i found it really hard to answer the question too to be honest so it was dope and since you first started music up until now would you say that there is more diversity and equality in the music industry um no <laughs> <laughs> thank you i'm glad you said that <laughs> I think that it's a long road. I think that um, probably in the last couple of years, there's been lots more um, like of a black presence in the music industry, which is great. Um, I'm not the only one, um, you know, like Razor Visa was, you know, the only other black artist that I knew that I knew of when I started doing music. Um, and now I could name, 20 you know what I mean so even though it's a very very it's still very small community I think that there's more and more happening creatively in general as well so you've got like I know lots of black photographers and makeup artists and videographers and so it's um really it's a really cool feeling to be able to hire um within the community for projects that I'm doing or you know what I mean we can all sort of collaborate um together to kind of build the culture um yeah, and it's feeling, I mean, it's feeling really cool. Like, I'm excited for the future in terms of diversity in the music industry in general, though. Like, the mainstream industry, it's still very, very far away from where I would personally like to see it. Um, but obviously, hopefully, you know, as more of us start to come through, that stuff will change. And just my last question for you, for you before we um, take questions from our viewers. Um, as a Black female and Kiwi African hip hop artist, what piece of advice can you leave for those creatives who want to get into the music industry? Um, I would say, 
I would say that um, tapping into the people around you is a re- like pretty much everyone that I've worked with of the last you know few years have been people that I've met on the ground at gigs um, and we've all had you know our own creative visions and we've sort of been able to like prop each other up and help each other along the way so I think that having good people around you who can sort of like see where you're wanting to go and and collaborate with you and all those things I think that's really important um, and then I would say just being a hundred percent you from the beginning do you know what I mean and I think that lots of people can get caught up in the idea that that means that you can't change your views or change who you are but I obviously we know that we're constantly shedding and you know relearning and changing who we are and how we feel and my music is constantly changing um so but I've tried to stay still me you know so if I I look back at stuff from five years ago and I can still be like wow I've grown since then or I've changed how I think but that was the essence of it is still me you know and I think that when you when you're able to do that it's everything's authentic so people can connect with you authentically as well um so the like the foundation is like strong and true thank you for that meaningful piece of advice I'm sure our viewers really appreciated that um because of time I'm going to go ahead and just ask two questions from our viewers um the first one is what was your most memorable live gig um oh gosh that was um actually this year just before lockdown um I performed at um a festival called Splore and it was like the first time I'd ever sort of had like a headline slot I wasn't technically a headliner for the festival but I played at 10 p.m which is like a headline slot you know Mm -hmm. um so it was just like it had felt it felt like the culmination of every single live show I'd ever done um and you know meeting people along the way like my drummer and my dancers and all of that stuff um and we'd sort of worked all through the summer we'd been you know doing shows and this was actually one of the last ones um the last shows that I did before everything you know locked down um and it was just yeah it was like electric I've never quite experienced anything like it and the I'd be I've been to Splore as a you know as a festival attendee a couple of times and I remember like having this moment like a couple years ago where I was just watching there was a um a rapper from the UK um a woman called Lady Leisha who was performing at Splore and she was doing the same slot the 10 o'clock slot on the Saturday night and I remember watching her and I was like, man, that is cool. Like, I want to do that, you know? And so then two years later, I'm like standing on the stage and it's like the exact, you know, like it was just very full circle and like very surreal. Um, and we rocked it. It was yes. so good. It was such a good <laughs> show. Like, yeah. It sounds like, definitely sounds like an amazing experience. Honestly, it was one of like the best nights of my life, to be honest. Yeah, it was oh, great. So good to hear. And our last question um, from one of our viewers is, what will the remainder of this year look like for you? And are there any more live gigs coming up? Um, yes, I actually have a show here in Auckland at Neck of the Woods next Saturday um, on the 7th of November. Um, and then I guess it's I'm working on a new live set um, at the moment uh, for summer. And that's pretty, pretty much, pretty much it for the rest of the year. Is coming up very quickly. You know, we're already yeah. in November. Already so. in November. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So pretty much just pre- preparing for the summer and hoping that those shows happen. Well, thank you so much, Jess, for chatting with us today. Thank you for having me. Yes. And to our viewers, thank you so much again for tuning in. Be sure to catch us live next Sunday for our last interview with artist, activist, and transformational leader. Sonia Renee Taylor. She is a national and international award-winning writer and performer, published author and founder and radical executive officer of The Body Is Not An Apology. Until next Sunday, 12 p.m. New Zealand time, my name is Diane Wesh, and you have been watching The Blackout Series. Kakite.